Oh. She's still with me. Okay. And uh, her husband is here. Oh. They're leaving for a funeral. Oh. And passed away. So we're just taking some mahal. They're heading off to the funeral. We're going to the funeral tonight. Tonight. We're leaving. Oh. She's there. Oh. And she, himself, and her husband, making Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll You're see. You're going back tonight also? I'll be here. I'll You'll be here, here for some time? Yes, I'll be here. Hare Krishna. You're going to a funeral? Yeah, my son, my friend is very late for the past uh, few months. So uh, I think she was in critical condition. So I quickly, with this sudden plan, I just uh, came. And she was she was like she was critical for three days. And yesterday I managed to go for the water. I took that cover, Nachina oil, and I used Nachina picture on the thing. So after three hours she went to water. You were there, was that? Yeah. Uh, when she was alive, she was critical. Then I I was like, I did all the thing. After that she passed away. Yeah, because she doesn't think people are going now in this environment. And. Uh, and yeah, and come in. You want to do come in? Yeah. 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 Huh? Yeah, uh, well, I've got an uh, uh, Apple, this is an Apple computer, but you want to put it in. You can put it in. Are, are people going to be able to see? Maybe the projector should be this side, you yeah. know. Would it be possible?
Is it on? Alright, Omagyana Dumaranda Syagyana Jana Shalakaya Chaktur Milita Nyena Desmai Shri Guru Bhai Namaha Vancha Kaupa Darudhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhai Vacha Patita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishnu Vidyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadara Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So this evening and tomorrow evening, next evening also, I'm going to speak from the section of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the second canto, particularly this first chapter 
which is very powerful, very important. Uh, it's important for us to study Srimad Bhagavatam regularly. Although we have a Bhagavatam, a Bhagavatam class every morning, I know you're, many of you are working, you're not able to come for a class. We have a small group every morning here. So this evening and next few evenings while I'm here, we want to speak on Srimad Bhagavatam. And I'm, I'm using the presentations which we were been using in Mayapur to present Srimad Bhagavatam studies. I hope it will be useful for you. I thought it's a particularly useful chapter. So uh, here is a quote, first of all about the Canto 1, that everyone serious about understanding the transcendental science and seeing the transcendental form of the Lord must first of all attempt to see the lotus feet of the Lord by studying the first and second cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. When one sees the lotus feet of the Lord, all kinds of doubts and fears within the heart are vanquished. So the importance of the first two cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam has to be firmly understood and appreciated. Don't think, oh, I've gone through the first canto, I know it. There's so much more we can learn. The very first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam was commented on by Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati for 30 days. And he said, there's so much more we could say. 30 days. He said, I'm just introducing the first verse to you. So what to speak of the whole first canto? It's, there's so much there. And then the second canto as well. It's all considered the Pada Padma, the lotus feet of the Lord. The different cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam represent different bodily limbs of the Lord. And the first two cantos are the lotus, the lotus feet of the Lord. When we go for darshan, when we come to see the deities, we must look first of all at the lotus feet of the Lord. And then we look up towards the face of the Lord. And so this is the proper etiquette in studying Srimad Bhagavatam, that we must study Srimad Bhagavatam from the beginning. It's important for us get a good grasp of the first two cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam and it will certainly help you to relish more further cantos. So this is the, the point which is made here. This is actually taken from Prabhupada's purport from the fourth canto, chapter 24, text number 52. So Srila Prabhupada in that purport is in encouraging us, reminding us. Alright, just to review, revise for you what happened in the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Before we begin the second canto, we should understand what took place in the first canto. And so the, the canto began, the first, the first chapter was questions by the sages. We were in the, we find ourselves in the Naimisharanya forest. Of course, even before that, there are three introductory verses given by Srila Vyasadeva, which are the invocation to the Srimad Bhagavatam. The first three verses, they're very important, and profound verses, which devotees like to recite. And as I said, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati spoke on the very first verse for 30 days. And Prabhupada regularly also spoke on the first verse. And it's an extensive purport. There's a lot of comments by the Acharyas there. 
So that's the first three verses, which are the invocation to the Srimad Bhagavatam. But then the first chapter brings us to Naimasharanya, where the sages are all seated. And the sages are led by Shonaka Rishi. Sometimes people get confused with all of these different names. There's, there's Sukha Deva Goswami, there's Sutta Goswami, and there's also Shonaka Rishi. And so you have to hear these names and become familiar with them. They are connected. Sukha Deva Goswami is the son of Vyasadeva. And he will be the one who will speak the Srimad Bhagavatam. But in the first canto, we don't hear immediately about Sukadeva Goswami, rather, we're introduced to Sutta Goswami. And Sutta Goswami is a student, he was one of the students of Sukadeva Goswami. Sutta Goswami was actually present when Shukadeva Goswami instructed Maharaj Parikshit in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And after he heard Shukadeva Goswami instruct Maharaj Parikshit, then Sutta Goswami came to Naimasharanya. And in Naimasharanya, he took the place of his father, uh, Romaharshan Sutta. Romaharshan Sutta had been killed by Lord Balaram and in the place of Romaharshan Sutta, the son of Romaharshan Sutta, Sutta Goswami was given the place to be the speaker. So Sutta Goswami is addressed by the sages in Naimisharanya mentioned here. Sutta Goswami is welcomed by the sages. He's welcomed by the sage. Chapter 1, the sages welcome him, they glor honor him, glorify him, and then they ask questions to him. And these questions make up the substance of Srimad Bhagavatam. There are some qu six questions which are put there in the very first chapter to Sutta Goswami. And these questions are answered as you go through Srimad Bhagavatam. So the first three chapters is like that, chapter 2 and 3, Sutta, Sutta Goswami is replying to some of the questions of the sages. And then chapter 4 to chapter 6, we hear about how Srila Vyasadeva came to write this book because they wanted to understand how did the Srimad Bhagavatam come about? What, 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 what was the cause of it? What happened? And then we hear about how Srila Vyasadeva had written many books but was not satisfied. And at that time his guru, who was Narada Muni, came to him and instructed him. And he instructed him that the reason why you are not satisfied is because you have not properly glorified the process of devotional service. You should properly glorify the process of bhakti yoga. You've simply encouraged people in the path of fruitive activities. The path of the Vedas is generally concerned with the modes of nature and fruitive activities, how you can go to heaven, and how you can enjoy material opulence and that of course people are eager to hear that kind of stuff. They're very attracted to how to improve their material life. But that is not the real goal of life and certainly the Srimad Bhagavatam is not teaching that. So the Srimad Bhagavatam, this is the mature realizations of Srila Vyasadeva. After Srila Vyasadeva had been instructed by his guru, then he understood what he'd done wrong. And he made amends for his actions by writing Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So the Srimad Bhagavatam is described as the ripened fruit of all of the Vedas. And so from the Srimad Bhagavatam we will hear the glorification of the process of devotional service and we will hear also the glorification of Lord Krishna, the Swayam Bhagavan, personality of Godhead. But we won't hear about Lord Krishna immediately. As I said, the Srimad Bhagavatam, each canto represents different bodily limbs. So in visualizing the form of the Lord, one should progress from the lotus feet gradually up to look on the face of the Lord. So the Lord's face is there in the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the first two cantos are the lotus feet. So Narada Muni instructs Vyasadeva, then chapter 7 to 16, we will hear about the disappearance of great personalities. We, you, well, of course, you, most of you have read the first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, and you know about the disappearance of Grandfather Bhishma, and then we hear about also the departure of Dhritarashtra and then we hear also how the Yadu dynasty annihilate each other and they all depart from the world and then Lord Krishna also leaves the world and then the Pandavas also retire from the world. So all of this is described in the first canto, in the first canto, the disappearance of so many great personalities. And with the disappearance of all of these personalities, the scene is then set for the appearance of Sukadeva Goswami. So, Sukadeva Goswami, well, before that, before that you have the, the cursing of Maharaj Parikshit. And after the cursing of Maharaj Parikshit, then Sukadeva Goswami appears. And so chapter 17 to 19 in the first canto describe the meeting, how Sukadeva Goswami comes. Jai, Jai, Subhadra, Ki, Jai. So you have the meeting of Sukadeva Goswami and Maharaj Parikshit because Maharaj Parikshit had been cursed. He was initially, he was put on the throne. With the departure of the Pandavas, Maharaj Parikshit became the ruler. He was the successor of the Pandavas and he was ruling the, 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 the world practically. But then he was cursed and he has only seven days to prepare for his death, seven days remaining. And this way he gave up everything, renounced everything and went to look for someone to guide him. And it was arranged that Sukadeva Goswami appeared to guide him. And this is all described in the first canto. So the end of the first canto, you have the meeting of Sukadeva Goswami with Maharaj Parikshit. And you hear also Maharaj Parikshit put his question to Sukadeva Goswami. He has one question which is very important. He wants to know what is the duty of a person who is about to die and what is the duty of all people at all time because we're all going to die one day. We have to admit that that, that is the, the, the fact. Prabhupada would quote the, the, the saying which we have, they say, death is as sure as death. Nothing is, you say, Rob, it's not, is everything, sh are you sure? Well, as sure as death, and death is sure, right, for everyone. So we have to prepare for that. And this is the meeting between Maharaj Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami.
So then you come to the second canto and we're just going to look at the first chapter. I'm not going to go through what's in all these other chapters in the second canto. Um, but we're going to try to look at the first two, three chapters which we have here in the second canto. So you can see the breakdown of the first chapter which we want to look at tonight. We're just going to look at this first section, the best use of human life. And then this, the first chapter then after hearing about the best use of human life because Sukadeva Goswami wants to impress upon Maharaj Parikshit that what he's done, that he's left home and he's come and he's ready to just sit and hear that that was the best, the best use of human life. He'd, made, he'd done the right choice. He'd come and he put aside everything else. He's not even thinking about prasadam. Can you imagine it? Wow. He's not, no more eating, not even drinking and he's just there to hear and he's just going to hear with full concentration from Shukadeva Goswami. So uh, Maharaj Parikshit is very, Nishta is very fixed because he knows death is coming, he's very serious. And then the second half of the first chapter, which we'll go into tomorrow night probably, is contemplating the universal form, which is Bhakti Mishra Yoga. It's yoga with a bit of devotion mixed, mixed in. All right, so uh, we're not going to look at these things, sorry. Okay, connection. How do we come from the first canto, the first canto into the second canto? So that, that you can see the question which Maharaj Parikshit put to Sukadeva Goswami. Oh trustworthy Brahmana, I now ask you about my immediate duty. Please, after proper deliberation, tell me of the unalloyed duty of everyone in all circumstances and specifically of those who are just about to die. So that question was put in the first canto, chapter 19, that's the last chapter of the first canto and this is how we come to the second canto because the second canto is where Sukadeva Goswami is going to reply to this question. He's going to begin his reply anyway. And the whole Srimad Bhagavatam is actually the reply to this question. How do we prepare for, for this moment about to die? Uh -uh. Here also, and again the same question was practically reiterated in a different way also in the first canto in the, this last chapter text 37 38 uh, Maharaj Parikshit says to Sukadeva Goswami you are the spiritual master of great saints and devotees I am therefore begging you to show the way of perfection for all persons and especially for one who is about to die. Please let me know. And now you can see Maharaj Parikshit, what he wants to know. He said, let me know what should a man hear, chant, remember and worship. And also what should he not do? Please explain all this to me. There are things which you should do and there are things which you should not do, right? Just like when we become devotees, we also, when we get initiation, we make a vow what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, right? We're going to chant 16 rounds every day. We make the promise and we're not going to do 
you know, the, the meat eating, intoxication, gambling, and illicit connection with the other sex, all of these things are finished. So, like that, this bhakti yoga, there, there are do's and there are don'ts. You can see in Asanga Yoga also, there's Yam and Niyam. The things you, do, you have to do and the things you have not to do. So this is the whole process of spiritual realization. We have to apply ourselves very strictly to following these kind of principles. If we want to progress, it's very important for us. So Sukadeva Goswami is being asked, I want to know, Maharaj Pariksit wants to know, what should I hear and what should I chant, what should I do, what should I not do? We have to be very careful. The path of devotional service is like the razor's edge. One slip and you get cut and then it's very difficult to stop the bleeding. So like that we have to proceed with caution in devotional service. So just understand the intensity of the situation there where Maharaj Pariksit is sitting in front of Sukadeva Goswami. And other sages have also come, people like Srila Vyasadeva and Narada Muni and Sutta Goswami. And they're all there, other people also. And not all of them are devotees. Some are devotees, not all. But Sukadeva Goswami was elected that he should speak. Everyone understood to, that he is the topmost transcendentalist. He is the fully self-realized soul. So we should hear from him. So in this way, Srimad Bhagavatam begins here. This is a quotation from Prabhupada's lecture when he was lecturing on this section of Srimad Bhagavatam. And he speaks here about the Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada introduces some transcendental humor. He says, quest loka, loka hitam, loka hitam means for the benefit of the whole world. So Prabhupada said, question was about Krishna and the reply, you know, the question was what should we hear? And of course we should hear about Krishna. And so the reply, the answer was Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada said 18,000 verses and each and every verse is so important that if the serious student studies each and every verse, each verse will take at least one month to understand. Right? I told you Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati began like that. The first verse, one month. So Prabhupada said, each verse will take one month. And there are 18,000 verses. So for serious student of Srimad Bhagavatam, it will take 18,000 months. 18,000 months means how many years? 1,500 years. Oh, long life, eh? <laughs> it, it, it's like we give when you give blessings, you know, in, in Chinese when you give blessings, we say Shobinan Shan. Shobinan, may you live as long as the South Mountain. <laughs> How long does the mountain last? You know, long life, you know. Uh, so like that, this, the, you need the long life. Wan soy, wan soy, they say in Chinese also. They'll touch the floor and say, wan soy, 
and they'll say the person's name, you know. I remember I, we were doing Vyasa Puja for Jagpataka Swami one year in Mayapur and I spoke and I said, I will bless you the way they bless the king in China. And I said, Jagpataka Swami, one soy. And he said, oh, 10,000 years, I will live for 10,000 years. He said, oh, that's, that's the golden era of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Kali Yuga. Is it very good? I'll be able to stay for the, the whole golden era. <laughs> so like that, Prabhupada is saying, serious student, you have to study. And then Prabhupada's speaking about this Lokahitam. Because Bhagavatam is so nice, transcendental subject matter discussed about Krishna. It is Lokahitam. It should be spread all over the world. We are trying to spread all over the world. His Holiness Jananda Goswami Maharaj, he got the Bhagavatam reprinted in French. Many years ago, they had, had it done in French, but somehow the preaching in France went down and there were no hardly any devotees and there was no book distribution going on. But then after many years, then Jananda Maharaj went there and he revived it and they managed to also get, find out, oh, there used to be a Srimad Bhagavatam in French. Uh, where is it? And they didn't have it, and there were no copies. So then they managed to find out they got copy. They got a copy somewhere, and they redid it, reprinted the Bhagavatam, and they're distributing so many copies. Last Christmas marathon, they distributed many copies of Srimad Bhagavatam in French, and of course we have it in other. We have it in Chinese also. The Srimad Bhagavatam. We have it in Russian, we have it in many languages, the whole Bhagavatam translated. So Prabhupada said, that it's so nice, it should be spread all over the world. Loka does not mean your country or your society, Brahmana society, Goswami society. You see Prabhupada's lecturing in Vrindavan. He's lecturing in Vrindavan, so he's talking to the Goswamis, the, the caste Goswamis, the people there in Vrindavan. And he's saying to them, he said, Loka does not mean Goswami society. Because the Goswamis are, you know, the, the, the people who take care of the deities in Vrindavan, they took the name Goswami. Hare Krishna. They, they have the name Goswami. They're not sannyasis, but they use the name Goswami because they took over from one of the original Goswamis. The deity worship in the different temple of the Goswamis was taken over by Grihastas, but they took the name Goswami. They, they all call them, they have the, you know, uh, Padmana, Padmanabha Goswami, you know, it's like that, yeah. they, they're, they're, they're all the Goswami families, they're doing the puja in the town. So Prabhupada is speaking to them, he's saying this Srimad Bhagavatam, it's not just for you, it's not just for you Goswamis, it's for the whole world. He said, Lokahitam, for the benefit of the whole world, this is Lokahitam, not only of this world, but other worlds also, of the whole universe, Lokahitam Ripa, my dear king, your prashna, your prashna, your question. So this message of Srimad Bhagavatam should be spread all over the world. So Kadeva Goswami begins the second canto in this way. He talks about, he said, your question, because Sukadeva Maharaj Parikshit had asked Sukadeva Goswami this question. And Sukadeva Goswami said, oh, your question is very nice. 
and certainly your question is for the benefit of the whole world. You know, sometimes, you know, we may ask a question, it's just for our benefit, just for the benefit of a few people. But this question which Maharaj Parikshit had asked, Sukadeva Goswami said, this is Lokahitam Nirpa, this is for the benefit of the whole, not only this world Prabhupada, for all living entities everywhere. It is such a nice question. And this is the subject matter replying to this question. This is the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, from Prabhupada's purport, this very nice quotation about the Ganges water and how it purifies everything. Prabhupada's sister, who we call Pishima, she always carried a small bottle, bottle of Ganga Jal with her. And wherever she would go, she would splash Ganga water everywhere. She would splash it on the people. Wherever, after she sat down, she stand up, she put some Ganga water. Everywhere, yeah, everywhere she, she would always sprinkle Ganga water everywhere. Hmm, very nice. So here Prabhupada is talking about the Ganges water. It said, wherever the Ganga water flows, it purifies that place. So similarly, the topics of Krishna are so pure that wherever they are spoken, everyone involved is purified. The speaker, the, the person who put the question, the person who answers the question, and the audience, they all benefit. Prabhupada makes that point also in the introduction to Krishna book. When you, if you read the introduction to our Krishna book, then Prabhupada mentions how this book is beneficial for three people, and the, the hearer, the speaker, and the audience. So everyone benefits, and they, Prabhupada compares it to the Ganga water, the, wherever the Ganges is flowing, purified. So then Sukadeva Goswami goes on to speak about how some people are absorbed in material life. They're very busy in their material life. He wants to encourage Maharaj Parikshit because Maharaj Parikshit has given up everything. He was, he was a king, so he was very busy with administration and so many social responsibilities. But now, with the curse on him, he has given up everything and he's come to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. So Sukadeva Goswami wants to encourage him and he tells him about how people, the, the, so many materialistic people, they waste their time hearing subject matters which are of no value which have no meaning. So, we ask you, you know, we have to understand, Prabhupada's purport explains there are two kinds of householders. There is the Grihastas and the Grihamedis. So, Grihasta means spiritual ashram. The family live together for spiritual advancement. The purpose of household life, you get married in Krishna consciousness, is to make spiritual advancement. It's not for sense gratification. But we enter into family life, our devotees, 
then they get married in Krishna consciousness, it's for their spiritual advancement. Of course, in the Course sometimes people often forget this and, you know, although we're devotees, we have to remember what is actually our real purpose in entering into the Grihastha Ashram. So Prabhupada talks about this because Sukadeva Goswami was talking about it, how people are so busy in their material life. And they're just simply Grihamedes. So what are some of the symptoms of Grihamedes? Yes? How would you understand? You know, somebody who is Grihasta, they're dedicated to spiritual practice. They will use their time to chant, and to go to temple and to worship the deity, the preaching these things. What about the Grihamedes? What are they doing? Working to make money. They want more money. They never have enough money. So money, this wealth, this is a big problem. We become intoxicated by wealth. We become proud of having wealth. When you get more wealth, then you want to get the bigger house and the bigger car. You're never satisfied. So this is a Grihamedi consciousness. We're simply Grihamedians are especially envious of others. And they think, well, why should they have like that? Why shouldn't I have it also? And we have this kind of mentality that we, we, we don't have enough. We have to get more. And this is a big problem in our life. We spend so much time working, get more money. Of course, a lot of the money goes for things like not only houses and cars, but then education, the children's education. You, some people spend their whole life paying back the loans which they get for their children's education. Well, at least they have a better material life, maybe. But what about their spiritual life? So Grihastas, they are concerned with spiritual advancement. And Grihamedis, they are simply thinking of their sense gratification. They are simply, they want to eat better and to sleep better. Then they think about mating and defending also. They like to enjoy these things. So the business of the Grihamedes is just centered around the animal propensities. The eating and the sleeping and the mating and the defending. They don't make good use of the human life. They waste their human life. And it's a great sorrow to see this happen to people. But most of the world are in that condition. But sometimes it even happens to our devotees. The devotees also become like Grihamedis. They're simply thinking material situations. They're trying to always improve themselves materially. They don't think about their spiritual situation. So you have to be bad. We have to be conscious of these things. You know, how, am, am I becoming a, a Grihamedi or am I a Grihasta? It's very easy for us to fall into that trap to become allured by the material energy. 
and sometimes we don't even know it. And somebody points it out to you and you get angry. Very difficult. <laughs> All right. So then Sukadeva Goswami starts his answer by explaining what we should not do. Maharaj Parikshit had asked them, what should we do, what should we not do? So he, he began by saying what we should not do. We should not become a Grihamedi. We should not be busy in sense gratification. We have to put these thoughts aside and we have to focus on the real goal of life. We shouldn't waste our precious human life hearing mundane topics. This is a symptom of the Grihamedi. They're very busy. Our mobile phones, you can see everywhere, everyone's sitting. And is it Krishna Katha? Mm, well, I don't know what you've got on your mobile phones. It would be an embarrassment, I'm sure, to many of us. What do you read in your mobile? So mundane topics. Mobile phones are very nice in Krishna's service. I don't know how much service you're doing for Krishna with your mobile phone. And then running after money the whole day from early in the morning till night. Money, promotion, I'm getting promotion, I'm getting a bigger salary. Yeah, they give you a little bit more and you work ten times harder. We get caught in these things, the material energy, the the demands with more money I can I can enjoy my life what a joke you can enjoy paying your doctor bills for all your health problems and then your lawyer bills for all your legal problems yeah you get more money where does the money go lawyers and doctors that's what often happens. There, these people are just meant to take the money. <laughs> no offense to Shanti Rupa <laughs> She's a special doctor. And then sleeping and sex the whole day. One wife is not enough. You should have another wife. Or one husband's not enough, I should have another boyfriend also, right? One man is not enough, one, has, one wife is not enough, I can have another wife. Um, I'm having so much money, why shouldn't I have another wife? Take, we take shelter of fallible soldiers. Who are the fallible soldiers? The family, the servants, the relatives, the doctors. The doctor can save you from death. Now we take shelter of these things. I have a I have a big dog who keep everybody away. It's not going to save us at the time of death. So fallible soldiers, we, we try to protect ourselves, but they fail, they can never succeed, cannot protect you. Your family members, your family may love you so much, but still they cannot save you from death. So Prabhupada's lecture here on the fifth verse of the first canto here of the second canto, first chapter, Prabhupada said, they are blind, they are thinking 
that these things will give him protection. Pramata. Pramata means crazy. Crazy. By craziness, he is thinking, these things will give me protection. My son will protect me. My son is stout and strong. He will protect me. Cannot. That is madness. That is the craziness. So materialistic people are thinking like that. There's the fallible soldiers <laughs> and trying to protect us. Prabhupada explains here another lecture in Vrindavan. This is on the first canto, fifth chapter. Prabhupada said, they'll devote the whole day for reading the newspaper or some fiction or some novels for this and that. Huh. Retired people, what do they do all day? They sit and read the newspapers. This is their life. But they have no time to hear Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Apashyadam Atmatatvam because they have no interest in self-realization. People have lost all interest. This is the position. Therefore, this Krishna consciousness movement is essential at the present moment. We never heard about self-realization until Prabhupada came and the Krishna Consciousness Movement began to be propagated everywhere. People going around preaching and giving discourse. It never happened. We never heard any self-realization. What's that? What are they talking about? We never heard. But Prabhupada is the one who really brought it to the forefront in the world. And then after Prabhupada, then so many others also came behind. And there's so many other people, they came. So Prabhupada saying, Apashyatam Atmatatvam. They, they're blind to self-realization. They cannot see what is this human life. So very sad. Oh. Okay, so then first chapter goes on like this. Sukhadeva Goswami is going to speak what everyone should do, what they should do. They should worship the Supreme Lord, they should be hearing and chanting. That is the activities of the liberated soul. And Sukhadeva Goswami gives himself as an example that he heard Srimad Bhagavatam, he heard it from his father. It's not enough to just read the books on your own. You have to hear from the teachers. Prabhupada said, just like Sukadeva Goswami heard from Srila Vyasadeva. And similarly, you want to be a doctor, you don't become a doctor just reading, reading the books. You have to go and study under a doctor and they can train you. And the same way you want to study self-realization, you have to be trained under a self-realized soul. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining, but Sukadeva Goswami is explaining that he studied under Srila Vyasadeva, he heard, and therefore he's qualified to speak, to guide Maharaj Pariksha. And then he goes on to speak about the benefits for hearing. That by hearing topics of Krishna, then Srinvatam Swakata Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtan. You clean the heart. Hearing about Krishna is Punya Karma. It cleanses the heart of all material desires. You have to hear. So, this is the formula for success. You want to prepare yourself for leaving the body, you have to absorb your mind in hearing carefully. Very important. So we ask you, what is the qualification of an ideal hearer? 
who is the ideal hearer? What would be one qualification to be a good hearer? Well, one thing is you should have faith that what you're hearing is true and you should take it very seriously. If we simply sit, you know, physical presence is very good, but sometimes we sit and it goes in the one ear and out of the other. It doesn't go to the heart. We don't take it very seriously. We think, oh, Swamiji is talking very nice, but he's not talking to me. He doesn't mean me. I'm not a Grihamedi. I'm not a fallen soul. I'm a devotee. You know, we think like that, you know. We all have this image about our own selves. So a good hearer will be introspective and they'll think very carefully about what is being said, what is being discussed. And they will think, you know, I have to be try to be sure of this myself. I have to watch out that he, Prabhupada, Prabhupada's telling us things which are important. I have to also watch out and make sure that I'm not getting into too much maya. It's very important for me. You know, we, we have to hear very seriously. Oh, oh, Maharaj Parikshit, he didn't eat, he didn't even drink. Oh, I, I can't do that. No. Nobody's saying you have to do that. But you do have to hear very carefully and take it very seriously. Hear with faith and try to put it into practice what is being explained. All right? Is there any question? Sudarshan Prabhu, anything you can bring up? Sometimes people hear all these scriptures and they feel that all this is not applicable in the current age for their lives. They say, oh, this is that time in that way. And they don't see this, and as you say, they don't have that faith. So how can they develop that kind of faith? Well, they have to associate with people who have faith. Association is Prabhupada said 98% of Krishna consciousness. You have to have that association and you have to have it regularly. You have to be willing to hear. You have to try to appreciate those people who do have faith and practice seriously. And we, we should also be willing to admit our own failures, our shortcomings in our own practice of Krishna consciousness. But sometimes we're not willing to do that. But we think, you know, no, I'm okay, I'm good. We don't like to see our own faults. It's, it's painful for us. But that is how we can correct ourselves, how we can improve. We have to be looking at our own self. Look at our own self. Don't judge others. We, we have to be careful of that. So having faith, we want to get faith. We have to associate with people who have faith. And you should also be reading regularly. Also try to read Prabhupada's books. Nowadays, many people now are making reading groups and they get groups together to sit and read. And they read regularly. Uh, uh, one lady who I know, she's got three groups in a day. <laughs> she's reading, you know, and she, 
she, she started reading herself and she started with one group and she, she liked it so much she got another group going and then another group and then she, her whole day is just spent reading with different groups. And it, it's, it's so enlivening, she said she so finds it very pleasing, satisfying to read Prabhupada's books. You know, difficult to read on your own, but when you have a group of people there, if you're a group of other people together and you read together, it's very satisfying. So very important, those of you who have a family, you should read together. You should be reading together with the family. You have a family, Krishna has blessed you with a family, you should use it in Krishna's service to hear Prabhupada's books, read Prabhupada's books. It's a very good education for the children. If you don't read the books together, it's not a very good example for the family, for the children. Oh, my mother, she never reads the books. Oh, my father, he never reads the books. It's not very good. No, the they, children need to see the example from their parents and that way then they get faith. We get a lot of children growing up who don't want to be devotees. You know, they've been brought up in Krishna consciousness with Krishna conscious parents, but somehow the children don't want to be devotees. That's, that's a great loss because we bring children into the world hoping that they'll be devotees. And if they grow up and don't take an interest in Krishna consciousness, it's not good. I was just in Vietnam and there was one couple there and they had a child, it's just a six-year-old boy, but they said, no, our son doesn't have any interest. I was surprised, what? Six-year-old boy doesn't have interest? You, you, both of you, husband and wife, were both devotees. But the son didn't have any interest. I thought something wrong, something very strange. And anyway, the, these are the problems. You know, we do, of course, young child, six year old, he should be made to sit and, and hear, and he should be taught to chant, to take part in kirtan and things. It's important. Komar acharit pragno dharmam bhagavatam iha. From the age of five, one should take up Krishna consciousness. So we do need to in put Krishna consciousness into the children. Very, there are future devotees. If the children don't become devotees, in the future we may not have any devotees. Because we're all going to die, we're getting old, we're going to leave the world. The children will grow up, and if, if they're not devotees, there may be no devotees anymore in the future. Our movement will be finished. And all our hard work building the temples, making nice temples, and bringing the will all be wasted because nobody wants to do the puja anymore. Just like we see in India, there are so many temples, and they had nice, built nice temples and put deities there. Nobody wants to worship. They all go off to do business somewhere or they go off to get a job in a big multinational corporation. They don't want to be a pujari. They don't want to be a priest. So it's very sad. And so we want to encourage the youth that they will take up Krishna consciousness. And it begins from the very beginning of life, they should be encouraged. Our own example is the most important. We have to have faith ourselves and then we can inspire others. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Brenda Key.